But um, all right, so we're back. Um, we're back. It's day two, so we've been uh, woke up early and took care of the dogs, and then did some training. And I kind of wanted to pick up the conversation with something that I said yesterday, which was, it's like the little tiny thing, like the aha moments I was asking you about. Mm -hmm. And I had an aha moment uh, with you out in the training field where we're working on the, um, on the call offs for PSA. Right. Yep. And to recap a little bit, uh, the call off is you send the dog out to bite the decoy, you call them back, you don't let them bite. And then you send them back out to bite again. Right. And sometimes mm -hmm. uh, the dog bites first and sometimes it's a call off first. Right. So depending on the type of dog that you have, the training that you do, Typically, your dog starts getting kind of weird about it, right? At least for me, like Lobo was getting kind of weird where I'd send him out to bite. And then the last, the previous decoy I worked with, I sent Lobo down to bite. You know, it was yep. pretty far down the field. And as soon as the dog or as soon as the decoy, you know, kind of stood up a little straighter, like the dog was going to, you know, call off, uh, he went into a guard, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I wasn't so worried about it. I know at this point with training, it's like the amount of reps that you do and and I wasn't going to try very hard to figure this out. And that's what I was saying yesterday. I wasn't going to try like, oh, sit there and like rep and spend a lot of time and be very creative, you know, because a lot of the solutions are very simple. It's just like a piece of information we don't have and we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And that's like the thing in a lot of different situations, whether it's like, you know, business, personal life, PSA training, whatever it is. And so today I waited it out for about two weeks. And today I got the piece of the puzzle that I was missing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it came very naturally. I said, hey, we're going to go. Um, we're going to do some call offs today. And I'm going to call him out first just because I need to reward him two times, you know, for calling off properly to yep. make sure that he remains consistently coming down the field. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think. When I send the dog down the field, I knew that I was going to correct them at a nine, right? In Martin systems, like it was going to be a nine yep. um, for after the whistle, just because in the past he's blown past the whistle. Like he would whistle, I would give the signal to come back and he was like, no, I'm already committed to biting. I'm already at a certain speed. So I mm -hmm. know I needed him to stop. Yep. Uh, but the when I decided to stop him was kind of the issue because that's just going to cause me future problems, right? Um, versus you said like, hey, wait to uh, wait for the dog to bite and then actually um, correct the ex biting. Exactly. Right? <clears throat> yep. Um, so tell me a little bit about that process before we get into like the grip work and the mechanics. Cause I mm -hmm. want to, I, you build dogs in a very specific way. And uh, every single time that uh, I interact with you, like I take up another, you know, thing that I'm going to add to my training repertoire because of the way you, you know, you build dogs for great grips. Uh, but tell me a little bit about the situation with a call out. That one. Yeah. One situation. So yeah, like exactly what you said, you know, like Lobo went out, uh, 10 meters away from the, the decoy, let us say 10 yards, um, the whistle goes. And then very shortly after that, but still not when he is all the way to the mm -hmm. decoy, he receives this correction, right? So he'll say, well, whistle correction, I need to go back. So there are definitely like now on this way that we're think, t talking is him being more hesitant to attack right. after. There are obviously then the dogs that won't be hesitant after that's a different story. So in this one specific scenario, I just like the dog not to be corrected, just to not turn on a dime right away, mm -hmm. right? Because we're expecting the dog to hear the whistle, stop, turn around and right. come back right away. And not quote unquote goof off and keep running straight because you call that 10 yards. So he has like another y nine yards to go. And then he has like that one last moment that he might actually make an angle and walk past the decoy and come back. So imagine he, he would have done this. In his head, that Lobo thinks, this is my plan. I hear the whistle, but I'm not, maybe not the most agile dog to turn around on a dime. Mm -hmm. And he maybe wanted to do a little later. So before right. he actually had the chance to do it either right or wrong, he already got corrected. And right. literally that sentence is what I want to pinpoint. He didn't have the chance to do the wrong thing also. So you just thought, yeah, he's going to do it. He's yeah. going to bite. But I'm like, I don't know. We, right. we, ne we would never know. You know, so like in that one specific scenario, the decoy acts just like the decoy is supposed to act. It's a face attack. So be ready to catch the dog. Mm -hmm. Right. Otherwise, the dog will start determining that the decoy is acting a little different and say, ha, right. that is not a face attack picture. So it must be something else. Mm -hmm. So the decoy should never. That's what I told you then on the field. I don't tell my decoys that it's going to be the stop attack, whether if it's the phase or a flea attack and monitoring. That's when the decoy actually runs away so he's not facing the dog um 
So I don't want them to be ready for a stop attack. I just want them to be safe and be able to catch my dog, whether right. I wasn't it was an intentional bite or not. You know that should always be safe. Um, so there, the dog runs towards the decoy and bites after the signal of the whistle, and then he gets corrected. Where we can say, "See, that was very clear that you did it wrong." Right now, next time, obviously, ideally situation, because I'm not saying this is exactly how it's gonna go. Next time, your dog's gonna say, "Okay, I'm gonna go," you know, bite because I didn't receive this correction like potentially halfway. Mm -hmm. Right again, I have had dogs where the correction did be be received halfway between the whistle and the decoy, but that is a very specific dog and a very specific different story. And it's a, like a whole rabbit hole where we right. can go down to, you know, in, in dog Breaking training. Down. Yeah, we can talk about the stop attack for two weeks straight. But that specific scenario absolutely is, is kind of how, how I want to introduce it, not introduce it to the dogs, but at some point, like where you are right now, that's how I do my training. Right. Like he should only be corrected when he bites and, you know, kind of go from there. Because now clearly the dog says, hey, somewhere halfway, that's where it's going to go wrong. But the dog didn't necessarily do anything wrong yet. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the hesitation starts. Yeah, because um, we were in PSA Nationals earlier in November and a lot of dogs would not go down the field um, and they, and you know, one can argue it was for a variety of reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Um, they just seemed like they couldn't see the decoy or where the decoy was, or, you know, maybe weren't committed to going down the field, you know, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Um, but it kind of what I, what I understood from just the, the way you described, uh, how I should continue on with the call off is that it's the results of the training that paint the picture, right? So it's like what you did and what, how we're going to train that ultimately gets the dog to have a very clean call off. Correct. Um, versus a lot of the times I feel like I've been stuck in the past and I'm, I've trained with a lot of different people that are also stuck on just from the very beginning, get the, getting the picture that they want. Right. Yep. So like send them and call them back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Send them and call them off. Uh, so I think that like, that's very interesting because it's like these little things that you collect over time are what makes training super effective, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Which kind of is as like a segue into the next thing I wanted to talk about was grip work, yep. right? Um, when I first met you in, um, you know, last year, uh, was it last January, right? Yes, January, first weekend January, or second weekend. First, yep. Yeah, first weekend of January. And I signed up to do some decoy stuff. And and at that time, I've been doing PSA decoying for quite some time, right? And there was always missing pieces that I feel like I had, which is like, I'm working the dogs exactly the way I'm supposed to, or I've been, you know, uh, over time just built the habits of, mm -hmm. of doing. Um, and I've always noticed that some of the grip work, the dog gets tired, the, you know, synthetic material gets, you know, slobber all over it gets nasty. And then dogs start slipping the grip a little bit, but we're trying to make them push. And the longer we work them, the worse it gets. Right. Mm -hmm. But the mindset is like work them longer so that they learn to, you know, uh, build stamina and yeah, all these different yep. things. Uh, and you said something interesting. Um, I think it was yesterday night or earlier this morning where you said you want them to have a full grip right from the very get-go, right? You want them to come in and just kind of stick a nice solid grip. Yeah, ideally. Yes, ideally. Yes, yes. Um, and so I've picked up a lot of uh, little things from you in terms of working the dog and building a strong grip. And I was just out there working a dog that you said, you know, was not like your ideal dog for you. You know, that you that you're like, hey, he's a great dog. And the dog bit hard. I mean, he's bites really mm -hmm. hard. He pushes hard and he's got a nice possessive on the grip. You know, he's one yep. definitely one of the uh, nicer biting dogs. Uh, but then you see all the other dogs that you got and some of the puppies. And, and then they, I'm like, <laughs> see? Yeah. <laughs> and then you see, and they're just they're biting really nice, right? They're they're super solid. And yep. I see I have one of the dogs that that um you um that I got from you were uh, last year and um, she's doing great. But what's interesting to me is that, um, yeah, genetic plays a big, genetics play a, a big part of it. The 50% of it, I would say 50% of it is genetics because then you grab a dog and a good training and a good process makes them great, right? Absolutely. It's and, a mix of both. But right. yes, I'm very much believer in genetics for right. sure. So tell us a, a little bit about your process, um, you know, start to finish, uh, you know, how you build the grip, largely mm -hmm. focusing on the grip because I feel like okay. that's what the sexy thing is, right? People love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice biting dog. Yeah, right. good entries, nice biting, being in straight, straight and in front of the decoy and not trying to spin around and basically, you know, as I'm having my stick in my right hand and the dog would bite my left leg or my left bicep, right? Um, as that pressure comes from 
my right side, basically, those dogs will turn to the left. So kind of avoiding that stuff is what I'm really focusing on. Them staying in front of the decoy, mm -hmm. you know, facing the interaction and not just like going to punch you on the side and then kind of run past. No, they want to, they should run through you. Not past you and tap you as they go type of deal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That makes sense. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely big things I focus on. So whenever my dogs are like young, I really want to like emphasize on certain things that we would say, prey drive, possession, mm -hmm. hunt drive, like all of the like foundational characteristics of a dog. I want to like kind of implement those before I might teach a sit and a down and an out. You're talking like the develop the prey, develop the possession, develop, yes. develop the things that give you what you want. Yes. And those things I would qualify as qualities. Got it. A prey drive is a quality, a good prey drive or a bad prey drive, you could say hey, this one dog has more qualities. Mm -hmm. A good hunt dog and a bad hunt dog, they could say oh, this dog has better qualities. Mm -hmm. So like I see hunt drive, prey drive, possession, uh, wanting want food like in a degree a uh, little bit resource guarding mm -hmm. like these can be qualities that we use in order to train these dogs right right so it's a, it's a little bit more than just they need to listen and they need to attack and now uh, but how do they do this how does this dog just gonna do all of these things m like magically for us right mm -hmm. so like whenever they're young maybe prior to six months prior to 10 months because i do like to slowly build up my young dog and not emphasis emphasis on a lot of uh, obedience young young mm -hmm. and or early down the road i like to wait a little longer I like to develop those skills like hunt prey possession all of that way more until i feel okay now he is now he is really getting it now he is really chasing something and really possessing something and it's almost to the point where it's an issue that's when i know i have enough to go train because like in the older days, and these are all like just things like how it made sense to me, right? I'm not mm -hmm. saying like this is exactly the terminology that I want the whole world to believe that this is what I think. But basically doing a bunch of obedience with your dog is taking a little bit away of the dog, right? right? Like if you have your typical six month old dog and the only thing you have done is feed it on a touchpad and now suddenly you're going to do an object guard, let us say, or something where the dog has to do the same exercise, but be faced away from the handler and faced a towards a stranger essentially, because the decoy is mm -hmm. just holding a toy or a sleeve then they don't feel confident playing with this guy that they don't know. And they feel more confident turning around back to the handler and do what they're used to. So that is what we would be considered. Your puppy has too much obedience. It's it. too much and it's too engaged with you, right? So I don't like to, uh, I really like to emphasize my dogs to be engaged basically more with a decoy than with me because I'm going to have way more trainings where I'm going to do obedience than buy at work. Right. Do you think that uh, in early puppy development, that their original sentiment or foundation that you put on them for, um, say, on the field mm -hmm. um, affects their performance out there. Like a good example is like I uh, overcompensated with Lobo a lot because my previous dog was like all power, not a lot of thinking, not a lot mm -hmm. of obedience. And so I did a lot of obedience with him early on. I didn't okay. do, I purposely didn't do a ton of bite work with him. Okay. Um, the normal crazy things. I also didn't think he was the type of dog to you know, do a lot of that. Do you think that um, that it has long-term effects? Like you, if you choose to do a lot of um, obedience at the very beginning, that will affect your bite work and the performance of the bite work and vice versa. If you do a lot of bite work at the beginning, you will, you know, you will have a different obedience. Um, super good question. I would say yes, it will affect. So you have it. to choose like kind of like which one you're yes, going to go with. Right. Where the, per what is done the perfect thing or you know, the perfect balance between the two. Right. So I'll say like, yes, like, I do think it will affect the dog. I don't think it will affect every single dog that will affect the end result. Because eventually the dog does mature. The dog does go through way more sessions than just six months of obedience. He's right. going to go through two years and a half of obedience mixed with buy work. And then after this two years and a half, you will have a different dog as well, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of the dogs aren't showing what they will become at three years old due to maturity or immaturity. So that will still change it a little bit. But whenever I'm really like whenever I think it's going to really affect the dog, it is when the dog is 10 months to a year and a half to two years old. Got it. In that moment where you're 
teaching more and more generalization and maybe you start a stop attack and maybe a, uh, yeah maybe you start a stop attack and maybe you do some more independent work let mm -hmm. us say that we have put too much obedience on this puppy i do think in these uh, moments of progression that your dog won't progress as fast or he'll have a little bit more turning around to mommy or daddy and say where are you guys because you made me in the you made me dependent on you for six right. months straight so i like to do the little bit the opposite again depending on the dog where in the first six months my dog should only be pulling the opposite way right. basically i'm creating a bad a bad pet dog mm -hmm. i want a little bit resource guarding in my puppies i want a little bit pulling in the leash and i want a little bit out of control and jumping and just snapping and touching whatever they want to touch mm -hmm. environmentally wise yeah. or snap as far as toys so i like this because i do think just personally i can add control to a dog not easy but like yeah. i will have control about my dog so like i just like to say okay what is easiest which is also a very typical thing we always say mm -hmm. in my in, in my whole life i've heard this sentence what is the easiest building the dog or breaking the dog. Right. So building is the most difficult mm -hmm. once you have broken him. So I like to build first before I quote unquote break the dog, right? right. Don't break the dog. Yeah. Uh, but before like I implement, yeah, yeah. implementing obedience, setting mm -hmm. boundaries, you know? Right. Yes. Yeah. That's what we mean with the breaking part. Yeah. It's like pressure and the... Yeah, please, please define that. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. No. So like the, the, you know, implementing too much obedience. Yes. It will affect your dog's learning uh, progression is really what I think it will um, affect them. Maybe not necessarily in the end result, but it's like, how many trainers are you going to see in this dog's life? Who is going to give you what type of advice? Like one day you'll know a guy and your dog's three years old and from three till four, he trains your dog and the dog will then maybe turn out to be the dog. He would be turned out anyway. Because right. that guy gave your dog one year of perfect training. So it is so difficult to say if you don't do this, your dog won't make it. Right. Because other, I know a million people that will literally tell me, I've done this my whole life, and my dog always made it. Yeah. And, and then I hear people say, well, never do this, because your dog will never do that. And then I'm thinking, I do this all the time, and my dog does it just perfect. So right. it's so difficult to it's say- the quality of the sessions more than the- Yeah, like. quality of the sessions. It's, it's just like being very taught true about, okay, we're going to make this dog out. Mm -hmm. Okay, but how long does it going to take? Is it going to take you four months or is it going to take you four seconds? Because right. both of these situations are possible, but that end result is going to look different. Right, right. If I sure. take four months to teach my dog a behavior or four minutes, right. it might do the same thing. It's not going to look the same thing. Right, right, 100%. And yeah, that is definitely, that is very important to me. So I just say, I like to build all of these qualities in my puppy. And then as far as like, you want me to go with the gripping behavior yeah, here? Yeah, because yep. I really want to know about, like, you know, the the length of the sessions and really the gripping behavior. I think that that is like the secret sauce, right? Yeah. Because everybody, you know, on top of like all the stress in in dog sports where there's like the the pressure and the drive and you know the accessories whatever it is mm -hmm. that's like like that that's like the stuff at the very end i feel like the stuff at the very beginning is how they bite how they possess how they grip correct right? um and i feel like everybody's got their own secret recipe but I feel like yours makes the most sense to me, you know, yep. specifically the way you guys build it. So what is the length of the session? What are kind of like the exercises, you know? Yeah. So let us say uh, the perfect recipe or the go-to I have, and definitely nowadays, I like to like to make him crazy, obviously. He's restrained on the harness. We are swinging the sleeve back and forth. So that's your prey. We're making mm -hmm. the dog chase something, you know, maybe we'll freeze it up and make him bark and activate the decoy or the rabbit. Because right. I always compare the sleeve and the decoy with a rabbit, right? The rabbit will never run in the dog's mouth, which is force feeding. A lot of children mm -hmm. don't like force feeding because it most likely happens with vegetables. Right, right, right. But whenever you have a candy and you keep it behind your back because you don't want your child to figure out, that's when they're there. Ooh, right. what are you hiding there? That's the rabbit who is running away, right? None mm -hmm. of the rabbits run in the dog's mouth and say, come take me. No, they ran away and say, don't take me. And that's when the dog takes them. So same with the with the decoy, run away from the dog, let the dog chase you down, you know, your typical misses on the end of the harness. Then we go over, maybe that's like five to 10 seconds, like kind of ballpark it. Um, can be less, can be more, depending on the dog. Does he need more? We'll do a little bit more. Does he look already jacked up? No point doing 10 more seconds either. Right. 
because it won't, it, it doesn't benefit the dog. Matter of fact, it might be I too much it. then. Yeah, it might be too crazy. Uh, then we have, we go into the biting, right? So like, okay, I give them the bite. So obviously I can like really break this down. Like I have two go-tos. I either want them to enter as full as possible or I even give them just like a little snag with two teeth. And then he holds it for a couple seconds or one second, chuck, and then he can bite the real full sleeve. You know, like this mm. goes, not. it's not specifically that only comes out of French ring, but it's a little bit French minded right. where they give the dog only like a little chance, hold, hold, hold. Yeah, and then the big grip is kind of the reward. Definitely after the dog has dug in in that full grip, then you give him one second, then you slip the sleeve, which is then the dog prancing around with his pr with his prey, with the dead rabbit, right. basically, with the decoy's arm. And that should motivate the dog to do it. So right. obviously we're talking about dogs also that want to do it, because right. that is also a different story about, well, what if my dog doesn't chase the sleeve? Okay, that's different topic. Right. I wanted to ask you about those two different methods, right? Because I feel um, like... Uh, I feel like I've definitely caused some different gripping behavior with some dogs by going with just uh, 25% of the the grip right mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Like, right, You just feed them just enough of the material to get their front teeth. And then you very quickly then allow them um, to push in and then succeed and you just full, access. Sleep, full access, yep, yep, right? Yep. Um, do you ever feel that that approach... Um, trains the dogs to even at older age to just grip first and then fix their grip. Then I'm going to ask you the question, do you do that 99% of the time? Because then it might teach the dog right. that. So it's like, I don't just stick with one thing. Mm -hmm. I also go towards more so, you know, like... Let us say there's one specific scenario where the dog bites with two teeth. This does not take longer than a few weeks or months. Mm -hmm. this, not, this does not take longer than months because this only takes the time period that the dog's on the harness. Right. Right. So like, I'm also not doing this attack at two years old, right. but whenever he is two years old and he only enters with two teeth, then he will hold until he digs in or until he has the chance to dig in, which is most likely when the rabbit is starting to die a little bit right. or give up. And then they have like, mm, right. which is the same with the decoy. When that decoy freezes up just a couple seconds too long or one second, that's when the dog feels his mm. muscles starting to relax. Bomb. Now I have the chance to bite him. And now I know he won't run away because if your decoy keeps running, keeps running, keeps running, ideally, ideally, your dog is not going to seek to dig in anymore Got in this initial three seconds of the attack right. because he feels, well, if I dig in, I'll let go in a degree and he will be gone. He'll right. be fuchi. So you're saying, <laughs> so you're saying that basically, um, when a dog grips like that for long periods of time, there's probably two main issues. One, we probably stuck with it too long. Like you're teaching it as an actual behavior versus mixing it into yes, the repertoire. Which I wouldn't do. Yeah. So with pretty much anything, you got to change it up. Like we were talking about that earlier, you know, work different bite pictures, you know, not always the same trial picture to give the dog a different level of comfortability and different yep. experiences. Um, and would you say that when a dog kind of like, comes in and locks in with their front feet and doesn't want to get a full grip mm. or doesn't want to, you know, possess fully. Do you think that that's an issue uh, switching between prey and possession from prey into possession? Yeah, maybe that is the like cause too, of it. Like it's too jacked up and like he wants to, and they want to stay on that and that they don't want to even consider opening up to possess. Yeah. So there it's like, a little bit genetics. Right. Because with, and it's so difficult to say, the type of dog I have between right. quotes, like it's so like, oh, oh, he has so special dogs. I mean, you do have some really nice dogs. Well, here. but I do have nice <laughs> dogs and I and and they don't just bite with two teeth and hold on for 10 seconds. And right. I don't have to, in Belgium, we would say milking the cow. We don't have to milk and milk and milk and back for the dog to dig in more. Right. So whenever we're talking about a puppy who does this for, 10 weeks or 10 sessions straight mm -hmm. and your decoy struggles to let the dog dig in, we can consider that the dog might be just content with that. I'm not saying that we cannot improve this dog or, or you know, it can be get worse and it can get better right. depending on the training, right? So like, I don't know if what you said, the switch between prey and possession, if that's really what it is. I honestly don't mm -hmm. know if, if that is what I want to pinpoint, that moment of the dog going over makes the switch, right? right? Because 
because I don't know. I don't know right. if that's what the, what it is. Right. But what I do know is that certain dogs consistently do it, certain lines, right? But then you can always encourage that. So like I've had like a couple of puppies pass by in my life that do this for a couple or three sessions. Mm. And then once they kind of get the feeling of, okay, we're digging in and we're slipping the sleeve and then I just go into possession and make the game fun, then they say, oh, there's way more to this game, right? right? But again, there, as we talked today, the, the decoy allows the dog sometimes to turn and pull and do all of these things. So maybe there, if he doesn't allow this and you don't make it physically possible to do this, or you just keep rewarding the dog for the thing we do want to reinforce, mm -hmm. that that's going to get worked away sometimes very quickly. Sometimes it's only a couple sessions with a young dog, a very right. specific dog I have in mind, only did this a couple or three sessions. But which I mean with just holding and not digging in, and you would like have a loose leash after having a tight leash and okay, let her in. Come on, please, please, please. And she didn't do it. But then after a couple of times doing it and the decoy is slipping the sleeve, the dog says, cool, right. clear. The dog understands it. The dog yeah. understands, right? So like it is, I think it is just the same as this one dog that has a natural focused heel after a couple luring sessions and another dog, you need to put way more work in. But whenever they're five years old, you might not see the difference who has put in the most work. Yeah, exactly. You have the same yeah. filler end result. Because uh, like today, the, the the level of some people having a certain dog training, I don't even know sometimes. It's like, why does this dog do that? <laughs> I don't even know if it's training or genetics. Because right. the, the training is sometimes so good and they make the quote-unquote worst dog the best dog and then the best dog never comes out of the kennel and nobody sees it so yeah. difficult, yeah. you know? But just, I don't, I definitely don't emphasize like, let us say if I do four bites every training, which I don't always, but imagine you do four bites every training session with your dog from eight weeks old to eight months, 10 months, whenever you want to implement more program stuff. Mm -hmm. Four bites, maybe one bite, maybe one out of the eight every other session, I will have this specific attack that we just described. Right. So nothing too much, right? But here and there, it's good for them to hold, hold, hold. And then if they do let go, we just go more in frustration and making the dog realize, look, if you're not squeezing with two teeth, the rabbit will run away. Right. And then obviously when the decoy and the handler do feel the dog is committed on holding and really holding right. you give the dig in and you go further with the work or you reward the dog. So, and then the other part which is the most of it is i'm aiming for full entrances right and if they are only 90 percent full then the digging will be full but i'm aiming for the dog needs to enter as or likes to i like the dog to enter as full as possible or as confident as possible mm -hmm. Just because if he is used to a full grip and he can also just hold on with two teeth, I kind of covered it all. He right. like, and I still need to train so many different parts. So like, as far as just gripping behavior, we keep it straight. No Frenching. We don't jump away from the dog because we're trying to promote gripping, right. not to take the sleeve away from the dog. So I start very much Belgium ring, where that presentation will always be there, where that, um, which I think a lot of PSA people or, or and IPO people will do similar stuff because that picture is always there. Straight, 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 straight. That IPO decoy is never going to run out of his line. Mm -hmm. Never. So they don't want the dog to think he might run over there one day. Like, no, don't right, teach right. him that. It's going to be straight. And that's how they're all that fast. The ones that are fast. It's because that security is there that the decoy will never be running away. Right. Right. But now some, you know, some dogs start anticipating on a decoy moving and then they might slow down a little bit. Again, not every dog. But I really emphasize on that full grip and then because we're otherwise I'll get too much in the rabbit hole of, and I do this <laughs> and I do that. Right. But as I go from Belgium ring and I progress a little bit more towards French ring as they're getting older, where they, the dog needs to become more snappy right. and needs to hold on five seconds with a quarter grip and needs to be holding on to right. it. So obviously we progress towards this because I'm doing Mondio ring, not Belgium ring. I'm, I know this, right. But I like full gripping, pushing, pushing, pushing and nice gripping behavior. So from these full entries or, the little entry and going into the full grip, then we go to gripping behavior, then mm. just more than biting the sleeve and wanting to chasing and wanting to possess it. Then we actually focus on those 10 seconds, five seconds, sec seven seconds that they're biting the decoy. How straight, 
full grip if they're biting in the lack both of the sides of their mouth needs to be filled up not, right. not just the top part where you're looking at because a lot of dogs bite full there and don't bite full the other side mm -hmm. i can still put my finger in there so they they need to almost come a little bit from underneath and bite full in the shin rather than just coming from above because if your bi dog bites underneath the knee but your dog is 80 pounds and i don't know 36 inches high yeah right. he is biting angled downwards so his whole he the camel back as bart would mm -hmm. say it his whole body needs to come from underneath and bomb fill up that under the underneath jaw mm -hmm. let us say yeah right so that's where i focus on a lot because if he cannot buy the full grip on a jute sleeve that is promoting gripping behavior i don't think he'll bite full on a suit who isn't promoting gripping behavior because right. we talked about that too monduring and french ring suits are not promoting gripping behavior really no none of the linen suits correct right Unless correct it's got jute on it yeah and you stay in the jute for a while you say mm, yes how long do you stay in the jute for and also i still go back and forth when they're older then so they might buy jute until they're retired, but like, let us say Victor is right now 14 months old and he has bitten the synthetic one time in his whole entire life. Mm -hmm. One session on the Mondi ring pants. That's it. The rest is always Belgium ring pants or the lag sleeves, of course. And then specifically for certain exercises, I'll go quicker to the Mondi ring pants because I'm doing Mondi ring, not Belgium ring. Right. So let us say an example there is like objects, attacks, defense i can stay on the belgium ring pants basically their entire life or longer but the first thing i want to switch to the mondi ring pants is the escorting because whenever my dog is 36 inches and he's healing with me and his head is on my hip height and the jute is drawing the dog in while the jute stops at my kneecap mm -hmm. yeah. so the dog is going to give me almost a second time to run and target correctly here in my calf which in monduring that might lose me already one, two, three, four, five meters, depending on how quick that decoy is. Right. Because you hear these dogs sometimes go clack, 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 clack. Right. Where they were <laughs> just not in time and the decoy was just fast enough. So the dog was good reaction, but just a half a second too late. And it was obviously a very twitchy, fast decoy in that case. So there I maybe want the dog to bite more in an for the Belgium ring people than a not desirable place to bite, which is right where their head is. Snap, mm -hmm. right in the in the butt or in the thigh, right? Where you don't lose these meters. Right. You know? So, right. but if I start, which is what I think, if I start to teach my one-year-old dog like Victor to bite in the ass with two teeth, because the ass does not promote gripping behavior, mm -hmm. I think that if I keep with this and I stick with this for the rest of his life, then it will become a habit to bite like this. And right. he'll never seek fuller because I allowed him to do it like that. So like basically, <clears throat> which I think is a very important thing to mention, every single time the dog bites, whether if it's for an attempt on the object or an attempt in the escorting, and now we're really talking mm -hmm. ring here. Um, I want him to overcome the pressure, whatever. It might not be pressure at all, but what does that mean? In like in Victor's case, that he at least goes from pulling into pushing once or two, two mm -hmm. times. He has overcome something. Because whenever I have a pretty well-balanced dog like Victor, where I pointing out examples are almost easy. I can tell he is a little bit more uncomfortable when he's pulling and he's a little bit more comfortable right. when he's pushing. It's just... It makes sense right. to, you know, because he you doesn't... You can see it. In you can see eyes, it. Yeah. So if my dog is biting you for 10 seconds, pulling, 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 and I whistle him off, I don't think that was such a successful attack for the dog than if he would pull five seconds, push five seconds, and then I call him back. Because right. he has overcome something after that fifth second. Because you could tell... Ah, now he's pushing. Now he is pushing you through the wall or, or pushing through you again. And now he is not actively avoiding. Because if right. your dog is pulling with all the respect, he's actively avoiding something. Right. No, but, you know, like, and it just gets worse. You know? Yeah, it just gets worse because he believes it works. Because one day your decoy will be 120 pounds and your dog is 80 pounds and he will drag him a little bit around the field. Right. And your dog does feel it makes sense to do it. Right, no, yep. for sure. So there I want to emphasize the opposite, that it only makes sense for months and months and months to push forward, 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 to stay in straight. How do I keep them straight? I'm very religious with my fences. Right. Wall, next, biting next to a wall, biting next to a fence, making sure this dog does not actively turn. So it's not just pulling in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. They can also just pull in a 90 degree way, which is basically pushing them out. 
whatever leg or arm they're biting on uh, and avoid that as well and if they can take the pressure of the decoy which could be for some dogs just the presence mm -hmm. you know because some dogs need five meters leash on the on the sleeve to buy the sleeve because if the sleeve is on the arm the pressure is too much just because of the personal pressure of the decoy which could be considered not such a good dog and then the other thing is like the pressure of the accessories right but if he or she, the dog, can take that pressure in the mom in the place where I think it's the most pressuring, which mm -hmm. is in front of the decoy, then I think he can take the pressure everywhere. Right, right Everywhere right. else. And in different pictures and circumstances. Correct. And, and it's never, maybe never waterproof, but this is where I want the dog to experience this rather than actively avoiding, because one day, one decoy will be, it's the 45-pound female, and it's the 200 pound decoy, and he does not allow your dog to pull actively away, then I do believe at some point this dog will say, okay, if I cannot pull while holding the sleeve, then I think I'll have to let go of the sleeve. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, that's such an important thing to point out just specifically because when you're building dogs, there's so many times where you work all sorts of dogs, right? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking one of our female Malinois where you know, there was a time where she was very hectic in the pulling, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember like, oh, well, you're trying to slip. And those that moment when you slip when the dog's pulling matter a ton, yeah, right? And absolutely. I always say specifically, even now when we're building dogs and you're getting a new puppy, the first time that a puppy ever uh, bites, I want them to make sure that it's full. I want to make sure that I get a push and then it's immediate slip like mm -hmm. that's the first thing that they remember it's almost like that like motions like oh this is what i'm supposed to do mm -hmm. right and so slowly over time i've become um very hesitant to work dogs for a long period of time right even for like little puppies mm -hmm. the floor pole yeah just because i feel like the floor pole what i'm teaching is not necessarily gripping behavior but yeah. i'm teaching prey like chasing something yeah, yeah chasing absolutely. something yeah. body awareness the, the puppy's learning to move yeah and for the longest time i thought the floor pole really you know was all about um you know biting a leather rag and making sure the dog, you know, tries to catch it. But in reality, for me, it's more or less like, can you know, do you know how to use your four feet mm -hmm. and move around? And if you trip over, like, can you turn very quickly, like become agile when you're chasing course, the fur pole? Yep. And then when we get into like the, like a first, like a level one puppy, say not jute sleeve, then the first time it's like, okay, it goes and pray. The dog, it's, that's actually when I first introduced like a little tiny, you know, the front, of the teeth mm -hmm. and then immediately after that the dog pushes in instant slip and i give it to you yep. yeah there you go and we'll keep it nice and short but um you said um to me yesterday that you know 10 seconds frustration 10 seconds of bite work 10 seconds of possession yep. how did you get to that process and why is that process so important i don't know when i i don't know when i really started doing this right like when i started like pointing it out that hey like i just do something i'm like uh, it's kind of what I it's kind of what I did. I broke it down for myself at basically the 10 second of each. And I honestly I believe those are the only not the only three things, but those are three main things in bite work. Chasing the decoy, biting the decoy, and possessing him. Right. So that possession is very important for the motivation to get there. Right. So like if I'm gonna make my dog crazy on the end to restrict him on the end of the harness then he bites that's where we take care of the rhythm of the biting tuck dig in tuck dig in tuck mm. dig in right where he bites full and straight and then ideally with that rhythm i mean the frequency and the rhythm of the dog digging in that that is a nice pace that's a nice rhythm that he doesn't just pull and push and dig in and dig in and dig in and dig in. And then he holds for 15 seconds. Like it, it, it you want to see a chaos. nice, you see, you want to see nice pushing consistently every Correct. couple of seconds. And, and the decoy is really the one that promote that. Cause you see, yes, you're very the beginning repetitive. for sure. Um, you're the one that's teaching kind of like the dance, right? And I noticed yes. it's like a rhythm. Anytime I've seen the MBBK videos uh, online or Bart on, you know, Facebook or social media, mm -hmm. and then seeing your stuff and working with you, you notice that it's literally like uh, like a one, two, three, and like kind of stop. And yep. like you're just, mo and then there's the same thing with the rhythm with a clatter, the same thing with the stressors. Yep. And eventually, you know, it's kind of like a, a no brainer because the dog then doesn't really have, um, a lot of opportunity to learn anything other than a firm, full pushing grip. If you have obviously right. stuck with it for months. Right, if you yeah. stuck with it for months. Um, and at the same time, there's less variables. I feel like whenever um, um, 
a lot of people train, there are variables where like the person's moving different a little uh, every mm -hmm. day. The handler's handling different every day. And yep. then the dog is just doing whatever it is that he can do during that time. Right. Yep. Um, but when you stay consistent, it's where you get those actual results, like the repetitive ongoing, like bring the dog out, put him out, you know, you drag him in, you let him explode into the bite, you set the grip right away, and yes. then we start the motions of like, okay, yes. every three to four steps, stop, the dog pushes, we move again. Uh, and then if something starts going wrong or, or wonky or you don't like it, um, you have things to actually change. You Absolutely. say, you know what, I've been doing these like five things or these three things for the last three weeks and the dog is doing X, Y, and Z, well, I'm going to move, I'm going to change this thing because mm -hmm. I know maybe that is the high, this, that might be causing the problem, right? Um, versus when you're doing something different all the time, mm -hmm. every day you show up and you're like, yeah, and that is what I said problem? yesterday with that go-to of the decoys. That doesn't mean that you have to train this every single dog in that one system that you think is your system. It is more so a go-to is not a system. It is just like, this is my presence, how I come on the field. This is how I progress from there. And then I'm figuring out this dog a little bit as I'm going. Mm. What I'm not asking is that every dog needs to be trained the exact same way, right? Mm. But it's because I have this go-to and then... Like I, let us say it's you go in a conversation and every single person you ask the same exact question, right? And you'll get like really good and start reading people because a lot of these people are going to have completely different answers right. and different mannerisms. So you can kind of ask a million people the same question and you'll have a million different uh, answers. Mm -hmm. So I do the same go-to with different dogs and I have a different, you know, million different solution or answers from them. Right. And Obviously, now I've been catching dogs for 13 years. It is, in my opinion, easy for me to adjust and change a change plan because I might come on the field having all these like, oh, this and this and this is what I'm going to do. And I enter the field and I look at the dog. I'm like, well, that's for sure not what we're going to do because that dog doesn't look like he's ready for this. Right. And I thought about that when I sent the dog to the first uh, call off. Mm -hmm. I remember sending him. And as soon as I sent him, I knew I was going to whistle. I knew I was going to whistle and I, and I knew I was going to stim afterwards, right? Because yep. I didn't want to invite you. And right when I sent him, I was like, I bet you Tommy in my head, the back of my head thought, I bet you Tommy's going to pick up that I use the e-collar and he either is paying attention to the light on my e-collar or he's going to know the, dog the dog's behavior. Yep. Yeah, he's going to know and the dog. And what did I tell you? And exactly. You walked over and was like, hey, did you use the e-collar? I'm like, yeah, I did. And, and like, then we got in a little conversation yeah, about a, it. Yeah, conversation about it. And I think it, it, you know, it was a great one. That, But that was all I needed. In my mind, knowing my dog, following that step or, you know, with that information, that really will fix the call out for him. He's a very obedient dog, right? Mm -hmm. If I if he knows the whistle means, you know, you can't buy the decoy because there are consequences, then that's all he understands. He just needs to know the rules. Mm -hmm. And if I'm bad at communicating the rules or I'm not familiar with properly communicating the rules, then that's where the issues, you know, arise. Like yep. at the end of the day, the dog's just trying to do like the best job possible, right? Mm -hmm. And to the best of our ability. And so sometimes it's like, if we're not consistent enough or we're not clear on communicating, or if we don't know how to communicate that activity yet, because we've not yet done it a lot, then that's where, you know, things kind of become an issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Brittany was saying yesterday that also has been the best on you that he's been with, with anybody. Mm -hmm. And then again, you can do it today. And then Agave did have an amazing session. And one of the things I, I realize about you as a decoy, yes, the dogs like are, are biting great, right? They, they do a good, um, they do a great job. But what I, I feel like you do, you influence the dogs in more of an emotional way than it is a physical way. So it mm -hmm. is what you are doing because what you are doing has, you know, has is promoting certain actions for the dogs. But what is it that, how is it that you're, you know, that you communicate with them emotionally? Because I see them like, you're like one, like get a dog to settle down mm. like on the grip because he's too hectic. And then you're like, I'm going to settle him down. And then you settle him down. The dog improves, right? The dog, you know, uh, his his mind slows and they're able to focus on the activity. But what are certain things that you're doing in those key moments that are promoting these really good behaviors? I don't know. I would uh, say, are you doing shit. it? I, I feel like there's something that you're doing with your hands because well, you're doing things that you're doing things that you don't know you're doing. Right. And but yeah. you like when I was working uh, Victor, 
Um, no, it was that. I think Simon. Joe Simon with the hand on with the hands, chin. Yep, yep, with yep. the hand underneath his chin. And for a lot of different, you know, for a lot of different reasons, people use him. I remember working the dog, um, a different dog, and you know, covering his mouth, the gap, so the dog's forced to go full and breathe through the nose. Right, like there's that uh, approach. I would say, mm-hmm. um, but this time you said if you put your hand under his chin, he's going to move his legs out of the way. And when he moves his legs out of the way, he's, he's going gonna to dig in. He's going to dig in. And that's exactly what he did every single yep. time. And it fixed it regardless of how possessive he was of the leg sleeve or the leg. Yep. If he was fully wrapped and I went under and did that, he was like, oh, okay, I got to go mm-hmm. back to pushing. So I've been, again, yesterday we talked about Doing something with a meaning, every single step, for sure when the dog's hanging on your suit, every single step you take is so important. So it's like, uh, because it is physical cues that I'm doing a lot, right? I'm grabbing him here, I'm pushing him there, you know, like I'm tapping him in this way or at that specific timing. So how you hold your stick on your leg sleeve depends how, where the dog's going to bite. It, it, I'm not saying that's where he's going to bite, but it will influence. So you having a left, let us say, we're always talking about the leg sleeve on the left leg, right? Always in this example. You having your stick in your left hand on your right hand makes a difference. Right. You tapping your, your non-leg sleeve leg or your leg sleeve leg makes a difference. Right. You putting your knee out or your ankle out makes a difference and you moving forward, backwards or sending still makes a difference. All of these things make a difference. So... Figure out what you're doing and figure out what the dog is doing in, in order to this because it's affecting the dog. Right. Right. So then all of these things come from Belgium Ring or NVBK. And in that case, then what Christoph told me, because that's the best NVBK trainer that I know and that I've spent tons of time with, right? I just haven't with any other NVBK trainer um, or at least spent that amount of time with him. So he would just... Like quickly as he works a dog, he shows me this, he winks, and I know enough. I say, oh, that's how he fixes it. Right. Right? Because now, like whenever I arrived there, I was ready. Right? And that's also why I said yesterday, pick one mentor and stick with him, even if he might not be the best of the world, Mm -hmm. but pick one, go to where you can't improve anymore, and then you're ready for more. Maybe you're ready for more already sooner, and, and you know, like, bits and pieces at a time. But I was ready when I went to his place. Like, when he told me some stuff, obviously I asked clarification, I asked, what do you mean with this word? But I was ready, and I was not, like, clueless, and be like, oh, yeah, and I just nod yes, because I want him to be happy, mm. and then I go home, and I don't know what he said. Like, no, I really knew what he said. Right. I knew what was going on. So like, that is where I learned a lot. Like l- all these little movements that he does, the arm this way, that way, this way, that way I uh, can change the whole arm. Like whenever the dog bites on my left leg, I can make him turn and somebody else is breaking his back trying to turn the dog. Right. But I can make a 90 dog turn like a basically just pivot on my heel. Yeah. I told this to a million decoys, pivot on your heel, put all your sat, uh, body weight in the center of your body, you know, basically pivot on the heel where your dog's biting on, turn around inside, never outside, mm. not, not as much. Um, and the hill turn, but most do- most decoys or young decoys who aren't been taught this way, they're lifting up that leg and trying to move the ninety pound right. dog. Dude, I cannot do this this way. Yeah, you know. So like, no physics can, yeah. physics don't work like that. So like, these are like little things that like I point out to decoys. They're like, okay, this is way smoother. So like, smooth work. It can be promoted this way with subtle physical Mm -hmm. things, making the dog bite good like that, like um, see what the dog does. So he was wrapping a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And you were rubbing here underneath his uh, jaw and a little bit spatial awareness. He drags in, poof, and he bites in full. Because I know when his body will end up there, then his gripping behavior will improve. So I'm just getting his body there, where it's again that fence will be there, right? There was another thing that that I wanted to point out that kind of goes with the fence was that um, he was biting me. And then there was a time where he was really like, like trying to turn, right? It wasn't he was trying to turn. It was just that he was fine. Yeah, he was trying to pass me or wrapping over the leg. Um, and I remember my first reaction was, um, to push him back in line. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, um, I remember getting yelled at by Mike Suttle years ago because I, there was a puppy that 
kept chasing a piece of food and I pushed the puppy out of the way so I could pick up the piece of food. And he's like, don't ever do that because I don't want my dogs, my puppies to ever think that a man can handle them that way, mm -hmm. right? They're going to be police dogs. And, you know, he's very specific in this process. And so I remember I kind of felt that, that I screwed up. Um, I kind of, um, I remember I felt like I immediately screwed up. I'm like, I pushed the dog to the side and I'm like, oh, why did I do that? Because mm -hmm. the dog, it's like, you know, it wasn't like a pat on the side where it's like, hey, you know, push harder. It was like, I'm dominating him and doing that. And at that moment, I was just like, oh, that's the only solution that I thought of to get him back in line. But it was very simple. You just say, just move faster. Just walk faster backwards and the dog's going to fall back in line. In, in that case. In yes, that case, yes, yes. right? And so, but there's a lot of those little things that I feel like that you have to offer specifically for like, you know, decoy seminars. It's like how to be very effective as a decoy without like breaking your back, right? Yes. Because it's like, you were saying with a 90 pound dog biting your leg, like just pivoting on your heel makes all the difference. Or just like a dog that is, um, a dog that's like trying to move away from the decoy, right? There is a lot of different things that you can do to just Absolutely. make that better. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but yeah, what is there any other little details involving like troubleshooting that you feel like you deal with a lot? Um, cause you have a lot of different, um, I have a lot of dogs. Yeah, you have uh, a lot of clients. You have a lot yep, of different clients. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, what are some of the more common things that you feel like you address or are very, you know, that you see from clients coming in? Bite work specific, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, ov obviously some of the, the gripping, but it's not that like everybody that arrives here has poor gripping, you right. know, like dogs bite fine. You know, like it's not that I'm the only one in the world that makes these dogs bite full. So like, like it's just like little stuff like, placements in the on the bite and then the turning the turning is something that i want to point out a lot of the times right that a lot of the dogs will turn towards the outside and the decoy just goes with it because then more so in french ring and monduring it's a dance right we're dancing and turning around with the dog so in a degree or just just like it is if your dog wants to actively avoid accessories and you don't have these fences to keep him with you he will just turn around. Right. And if he can, he will. And he'll bite this attack for 10 seconds. But that is a different attack than if that same exact accessory with that same exact decoy, same exact dog, you do this next to a fence and the dog cannot turn mm -hmm. and cannot dance away from it. I don't, then the gripping behavior will become either worse or hell out. Yeah. Yeah. Worst case scenario, obviously. Uh, but like, these are like some like things, like it's not that the, the dogs that arrive here are these types of dogs. It's more so these types of gripping behavior is something that I really want to tell decoys. Like, hey, you're already doing all of this work. You might as well put a fence there and teach yeah, your yeah, dog yeah, yeah. the complete picture. And, and what I would feel as the fullest potential rather than letting him actively avoid. Because I'm sure if you would let work the dog that isn't actively avoiding as much that mm. he will become tougher because of this. Right. Because it's also, you need to become a good actor. You right. know, I'm a loser. Right. Because the thing is, whenever you're in the suit, you need to be the loser. The dog is always winning. Right. If you always win and the dog can never win, what kind of courage does he have then? Right. Right. If they are play box with a six year old, I fall down all the time. I can knock him over in a second. Right. Right. My, the the um, kid will never play box with me again. So that is not anything different than playing with a puppy. How, he is uh, always winning. Do you do you ever assess a dog that? Uh, do you ever think that dogs that don't do well with very little feedback um, from the decoys? As I don't want to say uh, weaker dogs, but less prepared dogs. Um, some of the instances I've ran into is yeah, a lot of young decoys, right? They're decoys people are just starting off and you grab more experienced dogs or more seasoned dogs sometimes, and mm -hmm. then you put them on the on the new decoy, right? And they're okay. learning. And the dogs get weird because the people aren't giving them a lot of feedback. Yeah. Right. So how, go ahead. So how how do you address that where the dogs are on new people and they're like, Oh, I don't know what mm -hmm. to do because mm -hmm. the guy's being weird and he's not giving me the feedback and then you know now the dog feels weird and yep. the whole picture changes. So there I kinda wanna say it, a lot of the things in dog sport, what happen, and they ask me, what do you do when it happens? I say, I ideally I avoid it. Right. Right. Huh. So I don't want my dog to be, and obviously I'll have a dog and I'll, you'll have a situation where your dog didn't see the picture and he doesn't bite, although it can be the best dog in the world. But there I'm, I'm going back to 
teaching the possession and teaching the biting that well that the dog can bite a sleeve that just lays there, ideally then he does not care how the decoy acts. Right. Attack is attack and come here is come here. Right. It, it it could be seen as it's a behavior as just something else. Right. Um, one of the retrieves that you'll trust you for your dog, he won't grab. How are you gonna fix that? Same question, eh? Because mm -hmm. hold is hold. Well, right. but this is fluffy and this is hard. He doesn't like to hold the fluffy right. thing. So the fluffy thing needs to move more or you need to teach your hold better. Right. But both works. But that's kind of what, that's the, the real answer is that you have to teach your retreats better. You have to teach your work with, uh, do your bike work a little better, right? Like teach the, the yes. biting is biting, right? Regardless of yep. what's going and it, on. And it also really depends. Okay, like imagine that the dog we're talking about just got corrected for the stop attack and then the result after is not because the decoy moved a certain way. It, there was different stuff going on in right. the dog's head. But yes, let us say a normal, healthy two-year-old dog does like a couple attacks a week on his home decoy mm -hmm. and then suddenly sees another one and he kind of gets a little bit weird out. Like, yeah, you could have prepped this way better. Also, something that I do is... Imagine my dog is a year and a half old and he does a year and I'm the decoy, Ali is the handler and I'm doing a year and a half old stuff with my dog. When I come to you, I do stuff that my dog would have done at nine months old. Right. So you always take it, take it back a notch. You asked for it. You know, right. if you say, hey, I just introduced you out last week and now I'm going to do it on this new decoy and acting exactly in the way of progression that the dog should be in his home field on his home decoy, that's wrong, right? right? Your dog's going to get, like it's going to emphasize too much on that. And then this weird stuff pops up. So maybe that dog should have bitten that decoy once on a sleeve and slipped the sleeve. Although you think that the dog comes out of great lines and it's going to be a great dog and he has never shown anything wrong at your house and there was almost no reason to take steps back, I will take steps back. Right. And I'll make my dog feel good. That's such great advice. Right? right? That is what I do. Act like your dog is six months younger than he really is when you go for the first, definitely the first couple of years uh whenever he's trialing it's trialing that we're dealing with a different level of training and a right. different level of generalization and train and talk uh but let us say anything between like anything before trialing act like he is six months or three months younger take a few steps back like if he bites on the suit with me and he outs on me let us say victor what did i do today with you uh sleeve i whistle him yeah. off once and i slipped once right so like i take steps back for that where my dog becomes more confident because let us say with victor he will do this weird stuff right but uh, and then also there why well how will my dog not do this weird stuff because i avoid it because first right. of all i know my dog and i'm realistic like yeah he yeah, can get a little weird about this stuff it's funny because then the weird stuff becomes part of new experiences so like then the dog it's like a, a cue for like a new experience weird. is right. a cue for weird experience yeah yep. so like now i'm like now every time i bite someone uh i've you know feel weird because every you know what i'm saying yep. because now it's attached to exactly that, so try know, the experience. opposite next time right. get him out of control on a new decoy obviously we might have a different conversation then like how do i get my young dogs to be not out of control on these young but right but that's probably a better but that's know. a better issue <laughs> better i think issue i think have. you know so but that is definitely something that i want to emphasize on like like i'm going out on a field trip next weekend uh in pennsylvania with my tree dogs like they'll all be acting like i do accessories and i'm tapping them on the back and stuff like that with a stick and i ask my new decoy don't touch him don't touch him just work him like this and use the stick next to him and slip the sleeve, right? And you saw we already introduced a little recall on Simon. We won't do this there, right? Like it's, or if I do that there, it might be just me and her training like this. But he, we're obviously going for my dog to get, my dogs to get exposed. Yeah. Different decoys, different fields. So what do I do there? I'm not going to do focused heel for 15 minutes. I'm going to show him all the weird blinds that Todd has, mm. the inside building, and then himself as a decoy, because that's truly what's going to improve my dog. Not do it like I can do focused heel on Walmart parking lot. It's going to be the same distraction as a monitoring field. Yeah. It's like you're asking for trouble when you're changing all the variables we talked about, where like you go in the session, you have the same motions, you have the same, you know, uh, the accessories move at the same year. Like that level consistency that you have uh in the training session what sometimes 
people do is they go to a new place and they change everything. So like new decoy, new new picture, mm-hmm. um, and then now we're in, in a new place, right? Yep. So you're like asking for trouble basically yes. at the end of it. Um, and some proudness. Yeah, yeah, for people, sure. Because you want to show off the dog. You want to say, look what course. I've been doing. And you people know? say, oh, I'm going to have to harness him up. And the dog before here could have been his litter mate. Right. And he wasn't harnessed up. Right, right. No, it's, it's about who is the best trainer, right? And if you need to train every single day with a leash on, but that makes you play 400 out of 400 every single time, right. and somebody else trains without a leash and it's only 390 out of 400, hey, the guy with the leash was the better trainer. Because eh? right. the only thing what really matters is what happens on the trial field. It Obviously, it matters a little bit, like a weird sense. It doesn't matter how he got there. Right. Obviously, this can be pulled really bad out of context. Right. But, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. I'm, and I feel like I've gotten really good with with clients and other competitors' dogs or or people for Chicago Canine that bring in their puppies, and we bring them into like the bite room and the different areas of facilities and the canine grass and they sniff the suits, and you know, at that time they're saying, "What do you think?" I'm like, "I think this is great." Like the mm-hmm. dog came in here, he's happy and he took food, and I get the floor power, he chased it. Um, I think this is a great mm-hmm. first step, you know, Absolutely. because and people are like, "Well, don't you want to work the dog? Don't you want to do more?" And I'm like. Not really. I mean, you know, like when the dog comes in here and he's like, ah, I'm kind of bored. Like, you know, like I know this space is, and the dog's like shows that it's kind of ready for the next thing. And then sure, absolutely. that We're going to mm-hmm. do more. Mm-hmm. But if the dog is, you know, coming in and, <coughs> and, and kind of scared and isn't ready to do new things, we're definitely not going to, we're definitely not going to do anything. It's like, just play fetch with the dog. And I think people have a really big problem with that. Right. I mean, it's like you drive two yeah, hours, three exactly. hours and you're you like, work, we're right? going to club. Like, what are we going to do today? We're going to do a session. And then it's like, well, uh, you know, bring in, bring out the food and, yep. and do some markers, right? And that brings us to like how long and how frequent, well, how frequent do you train? You can train every day, right? right? Like right. the dog is recharged, it's fine. Um, I do believe if you train every single day over and over and over and you get the fullest out of the dog every single day, he'll get a little tired of it, right. you know? Uh, so and People do that, people, I mean, they They just, can, yeah, 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 yeah. So there, for a young dog, I like to do the opposite. So... I do straight attacks, just one attack, not just one attack, but basically just in attack. Um, I do this like until seven, eight, nine months. And that's maybe when I start teaching the dog different behaviors Mm -hmm. within the bite work, like outs and a little bit healing before the bite and, you know, kind of progressing slowly. But anything until up that point, I have always worked and I could have done four attacks, six attacks, sometimes more right? Which mm-hmm. is the typical thing because, hey, that fifth attack, the dog didn't bite as powerful yeah. as the first. Okay, do another one. And please bite one more and you know you're again, yeah, you're yeah. milking that last drip out of there. Come, please dig in one more time so I can slip the sleeve and I can throw you in the car, mm-hmm. right? So there, how do you fix that? Well, I don't make him bite anymore five times. Right. One time, two, three, four max. That's right. done. You know, until seven or eight months old. Because Crystal told me once, hey, if he's five months old, and what are you teaching him? The fifth attack? He has another million attacks to go and he just did a million attacks. What right. are you teaching your dog at five months old and the fifth attack that one training session? Yeah. Bad habits, probably. Yeah. So now, told me this at one time, okay, I have a whole... And now today we did a little bit more bites. We did like we joked like three and then four yesterday. Yeah, I was like, oh, time you is know. really, uh, he's really <laughs> letting this dog. Yeah. Uh, but, but let us say if you would spend like a whole week here, mm-hmm. I'd say like, yeah, one grip. That's it. Yeah. Take him away, right? Go take your child or take your child off of the table when it's still hungry, not when it's completely full. When you ask him then to come back, he'll run back to the table and not think... Right. They're going to give me two plates. Right, just the overall access yeah. to things. You, you know, know and that thing. is a little bit of the thing. Keep them man, hungry for the sleeve slash hungry for the food because in mm-hmm. obedience you can... I'm, I'm uh, applying the same theory in the obedience with food and playing toy or whatever. Um, physically and mentally have them slightly hunger. Right. Right? And take him out of it when he's still into it right. and not when he already wants to leave. The dog, sh- he should be the one pulling you on the field and you should be the one pulling him off of the field. Right. That is when I know my dog wants to work because we're having working dogs. Like that's the real thing that I want. Right. Or, or that's one of the little emphasis that I want to see my puppy do. Like, yes, I want to go to this field and no, I don't want to leave yet. Right. 
My last question that I have for you was, at what point do you introduce equipment in the bite work for, um, to motivate behaviors or to create a little bit of control? Like, like prone collars, e-collars like and stuff collars, like that? E-collars, yeah, like at what point? Because obviously with, with some of the dogs, you know, the, they turn this way, we apply a little pressure there, mm-hmm. they come this way. And what I've noticed is that your dogs are very fluid in that. Like they're just like, oh, they're doing this, so we do this, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so we're very, we're able to really craft the best, best experience for the dogs because they're so fluid in understanding it, right? At what point do you start that process? So I'm sure I've done already some stuff with the leash in the obedience or just all around before I'm really going to implement it in the bite work. Uh, so just quickly before I go into that. So like if I have a hundred percent obedience, which means like very much like my dog is engaged with me and mm-hmm. my dog is very beha- well behaved and has good impulse control on the touchpad and whatnot, then I also want him to be 200% out of control in the bite work. If I have my dog under control that much at six months old and he is not the biting dog that I really want, I have done too much obedience, mm-hmm. right? So first of all, that needs to be very clear that I want my dog to be out of control in the bite work for a very, very long time, right? So like I don't walk up, which I, don't, I didn't have that dog yet, but I don't walk up to my dogs at five months old with a prawn collar to the field, make him control, mm-hmm. not saying that that's a bad thing. That's just not my go-to. Right. Because everybody with his own go-to has his own mistakes and fills up his own blanks because they also experience this road a few times. And I have my mistakes that I make naturally. Everybody has. So I have my own mistakes in my dogs come back over and over and over, but I can fix it also because I fixed it over and over and over. So everybody kind of definitely deals with his own shit. Right and fixes it the way how they fix it and they're good in this way so like judging people in a young training a session training session with a young dog judging them too early is not correct because mm-hmm. they know what they're doing maybe right and they know that it looks sloppy and bad right now in order to make it look perfect in a year so mm-hmm. maybe they, the people have a very good strategy in their in their head so but whenever i see stuff like the prey the biting part or the possession become like it starts getting really good or to the point where it's too much. So like right now, I say seven months old, Simon, I would start some little prawn collar. I would do like the star mark prawn collar first. Of I had periods where I put like prawn collar and flat collar on the same buckle. Then I have like a, a like almost a suppressor on the prawn collar. Mm-hmm. And it's not completely prawn collar right away. I don't like overnight changes or solutions. Right. I don't like to out the dog in four minutes. I like to out the dog over four months. Right. So um, I start little wa- wait. Tuck, tuck, tuck. He waits, he stabilizes. Yes. And I'll let him go. Right. right? So that will be one of the first, for, first interaction that does not need to be a set or a down right away. I'll work towards this as we go, but I will go into this. Right. And that actually then leads into maybe a little bit healing mm-hmm. before going to the start place, before waiting, before biting. And maybe then the healing could be immediately released to the bite. So I can play with both of these things. So I'm already adding a little bit of control, sit and wait, maybe down and wait, maybe stand and wait, but a little control there. And then progression towards that would be a little control before there's some healing, healing towards the exercise or healing in order to bite, right? Right. So that's when I'll like, between, that will happen between like seven and I don't know, 12 months. Cause like not every dog is the same. Like with Roy, my first dog, he outed and he walked and he waited at six months old. So with him, I started soon, very, right. very soon. Sniper only outed at eight, nine months old. Yeah. Seven, eight months old. So at that very like about turned eight months, that's when I implied, implied e-collar for outing with him. Mm-hmm. But I thought it on my own. So imagine I had a little bit of a bad experience. It did not contaminate my decoy at the time. Right? So Mm -hmm. I taught the e-collar on my own in a play session. Right. Away from the actual monitoring sessions we were doing on the actual field. Right? So in different contexts. And then once that was done a handful or 10 sessions, then I implemented it in my bite work really 
right? Yeah. Where he has sensations or have the sensation of the decoy and all my decoy, but then it's not an odd or a weird feeling because he kind of went through the motions already a few right. times. So that I definitely want to have that if I'm using something like an e collar that the dog really understands what it is, right? Mm -hmm. That he has understand me that it's not just an aversive tool and chuck uh, shock the dog off of the right. sleeve and right. Um, but really depending on the dog, but let us say anything between six and 12 months, right? Because whenever we over, so this goes together with, we can over analyze puppies. Mm -hmm. Oh, that one puppy who came in the room, I was a little uncomfortable. And now the other puppy came in the room and was comfortable. And don't you do want to do more? Well, the cops are only buying their dogs at 10 or 12 months old for a reason, mm -hmm. right? Because they don't, first of all, they don't care. I don't care a lot. Like people are like, oh no, the puppy's doing this and this and this. And the longer I'm in dog sport, the less I care. Right. I know a guy who only names his dogs. He names the dog only at eight or nine months old because he's like, I don't know if I'm going to keep him because yeah. I don't know if the <laughs> match is going to be right. right. And other people have this dog at eight weeks old and it's going to become the next world champion. Right. Right. He already has a name and a color and he has, a, you know, it's the green one and it's this name, you know, where I'm not saying that's wrong and you can def definitely buy a dog, stick with the dog, do the full potential of that dog, which you'll have your limitations or you won't, depending on what type of dog it is. And you will have your limitations or you won't, dep mm. depending on what type of trainer you are. I have nothing against this, but it's like all these pups need to be the best in the world at the youngest age possible. None of the pups can twitch or flinch or do a little uncomfortable because now it's a panic or it's a nightmare right. where whenever you buy a dog at a year old you have no clue how his whole life looked like you know you couldn't overanalyze him so it's like why overanalyze a dog that you can see you don't you won't overanalyze a dog that you won't see yeah so exactly oh that's so true club yeah. members will show up with a dog at two years old and you give it a few bites and he has never bitten in his life and at two years old obviously he can have force mm. and you give him a bite and you say hey the dog is actually not that bad but your dog at two years old you want to have a whole complete program already right. and you would not be satisfied with the dog just being not that bad on the sleeve mm -hmm. <clears throat> but now we do put the year work and the dog a dog might turn out to be very decent so it's like what you don't know you can't worry about so maybe don't worry about everything you know or you see right but then also don't unsee it because what your dog shows yeah, you is also it, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's at the same time, picture. It's very, a picture. yeah, very thin line in there. Um, at what point um, do you, do you or you're using the um, obviously during the layering process of the training equipment, you're you know doing a little bit of beating, so you're starting moving in the direction of some control, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the in the bite work, uh, when do you introduce it to motivate biting? If at all, like how soon? So obviously you you have your process mm -hmm. for uh, building good grips. Uh, at what point do you use uh, the training equipment to motivate more biting? Do you only use it when the dog's having an issue to motivate biting? Or is this something that you motivate every dog to buy harder using training equipment? I think I motivate every dog guaranteed always to buy the harder and more and pushing in more. So maybe there I already draw the line. Every dog should be trained to the fullest capacity, just gripping behavior. So there I'll use harness and maybe a little bit leash on the neck in order to help the dog to push in <clears throat> um, and the fences in order to let the dog not escape. Right. right. So that is, these are the materials that I'm using. So the thing is also, it's nothing too crazy. The answer is not complicated. No, it's very not simple. at all. We were talking about that yesterday. Yep. Like most of the things are very simple solutions. Yes. So, so that these are the kind of the equipments I'm using at a young age, just to keep the dog very, very motivated and just doing the right stuff. Right. Uh, teaching nice habits. Right. It's not about, oh, my puppy is having bad gripping. No, your puppy has to learn how to bite correctly. That's mm. all it is. Right. Um, so, but like, if you're talking really like how I am implementing control in order than that, not to let the cart house of my dog fall down, right? So like a lot of where Nepapo is focused on is toughening up the dog. Is, uh, in, so what they don't want to run into is that they correct the dog once in a while, like once upon mm. a time, they correct the dog for, let us say, something like not outing right away. And suddenly the, every behavior falls apart. He doesn't want to bite anymore. He doesn't want to go anymore. That means like 
which is the opposite of what they want, of course. Eh? They right. don't want to run into this. Nobody wants to run into this. So it's like, I really also emphasize on that. Like you see this now with, with uh, Victor. I do a little stimp up in the heel position, mm -hmm. which is a mini recall, and now he can go by it. Right. So I don't feel like I'm teaching like, beep of the whistle and my dog says shit i need to come back it is yes i can go back right because that means i'm gonna go do something else right so that should be so this is how i like to maybe implement some of the tap to come back to me i whistle i tap the prong collar with a little bit of the e collar so my dog has now sense has sensed it or felt it hey this leads into that right and that's obviously where the whole napapo goes a little bit about and mm. it's not just them i like i trained the system before i knew what the words were right you know not 100 percent, but in a lot of the exercises i'm like huh that's neat, but I was doing that too. And it's not just this one name that I want to use as an example. There are other people out there that have great training theories and great training yeah, techniques. A lot of amazing training. All the amazing training really kind of boils out to the same process. Yes. That's kind of what I've seen. Yep, um, yep, yep. And by meeting people from different parts of the world, when you sit down and talk about training, you're like, ah, okay, so you came to the same conclusion I came to, but yep. you're like at the other side Slightly of the different world. way. Right, in a yep. slightly different way. Um, so that's great. Um, so I, uh, so now kind of like at the end of the two days, how do you feel about running that, that school you were talking about that one week, uh, program? Is that something you feel like you're going to do? The addition to, yeah. um, yes, I need a concrete, I need a concrete plan, but yes, like I've, I've been really thinking about like, like another, like to answer on a previous question too, like people come to me sometimes and I'd like to help them with the jumps right like the hurdle and the long jump in specific or the palisade as well like i think i'm pretty good in judging distances and and where the dog should sit and where he should go up and that means if he goes up there that he should be sitting there like i'm i think i can see this or analyze this fairly good in my opinion because i had my first dog that didn't jump that well second right. dog that jumped great Right, I went through mm -hmm. the motions. I I I, I troubleshooted with the first one, and I got a lot of help from other people, of course. Now I I know like almost not everything, but I know a lot of stuff to make a dog jump better or different. Mm -hmm. Right, so like I'm really thinking about like adding then towards the decoy seminars. I could add a day of maybe I'll do some jumping, and right. then the rest of the day we do the introduction of the bite work. But then I'm like, but I've I have a club member here. Uh, she had no background in uh, bite work, right? So like we started training a year and a half ago. And at that moment, the dog was a year old. Now he's two years and a half. Um, so right now, the dog, the dog arrived, green dog, green handler, right? And I taught her all the exercises. Mm -hmm. And I taught the dog all the exercises. So That's I'm like, right. wow, why wouldn't I do a whole week of, of you right. know, of, of that, of teaching also. This is how I start food refusal. This is how I start to retrieve. This is how I start to send away. This is how I start positions, healing, all of that stuff. Like I would love to give like a week, like Monduring run through, which yeah. wouldn't be exclusive like to this. Camp, yeah. yeah, it could be called Monduring camp. Like, and I don't want to say exclusively monitoring because a lot of the French ring, a lot of the Some other dog training yeah. kind of, yeah, yeah. combines in this. Uh, but like, yeah, like I, I really, I would be very excited about it. So like, I just need a nice setup, good structure right. uh, about how I want it to look like or how I think it should look like and have like a couple days obedience, a day jumping and a couple days bite work, let us say, where how do I start all of these things? Uh, I mean, there are a lot of things that we can do week workshops about, you know, right. like I can do a workshop that I say only working about how do I teach this without a decoy, right? Like, because I'm a decoy, but if I'm handling the dog, I have no, <laughs> decoy. Have no decoy. So yeah. I do a lot of stuff like with <laughs> sleeves and footballs and right. stuff like that. And, you know, remote reward work. Right. Um, so I do a lot of that. I have always done a lot of this, even when I had access to decoy. So even with my first dog, Roy, I taught the stop attack on a sleeve. I taught the defenses with a bunch of sleeves. Not that because I didn't have the access, but I also had the interest of training it this way. Right. Right. No, that's a great point. But um, we're going to wrap up here, Tommy. Um, hey, it was very nice uh, to spend the two days with you. Uh, Thank you. Training. Nice having um, you guys. Yeah, we're probably going to awesome. be back uh, during the summer, especially if you run like a, like a one week. I think that's going to be something really cool to, to be involved in yep. and, and, and do. 
but thanks so much for you know having us and uh, of you know training dogs with us and you know yeah. talking shop. Uh, and so for everyone listening, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll thank catch you. you guys next episode. Yes, thank yeah. you.